Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, family. I am Isabel, also known as Missy. I am a recovered alcoholic. It's really good to be here. Thank you so much, uh, James, for asking me. I'm trying to find James. I know he's got to be in here. There he is. Woohoo! And for this meeting, I was telling Claude on the way up that uh, I remember when Mike started the meeting, I ran into him at Publix, and he gave me a little card, and I loved it. I was like, I love the way he's getting this going. And uh, just brought a lot of hope and love. Alcoholics Anonymous changed my life, for sure. 100%. And I love this program and I love this way of life. So if I get too enthusiastic, you might want to go, hey, turn it down a little bit. It's really challenging for me to turn it down a little bit. But, you know, I'm here to share my experience, my strength and my hope. So my experience, uh, I have a lot of stories and I don't want to get stuck in my story, but I will tell you what happened with my very first consequence. I went to Catholic school all my life. Um, And when I moved from Philadelphia to New Jersey, I wanted to go to public school like all the other kids from New Jersey. And my older siblings were going to public school and I wanted to go. So my mom put me in public school and I was in eighth grade and we had neighbors up the street and Uh, my girlfriend, my neighbor, Gina, gave me NyQuil to drink. And I drank NyQuil, not knowing, unknowing. And I went to school. And all of a sudden, I was sitting somewhere. I, like, was, like, waking up. And this old guy was sitting next to me. And he said, he looked at me and he said, do you know where you are? I said, no. He said, you're in the nurse's office. You came to school inebriated. Uh, I looked up and there was my mom. And I was like, inebriated? What's that mean? I was like, what? He said, drunk. I said, oh. And so I didn't know what happened. All I knew was I drank NyQuil and I blacked out. So I should have known. That should have been a clue. And yet alcoholism is very tricky, very, very sneaky, very, very conniving because I went on in school to live this life that a lot of people would have thought was like, wow, look at Missy. She's great. And I loved all that. My ego loved all that. It thrived on that. And I did a lot of things, you know, I was able to accomplish a lot, like a lot of alcoholics. I was class president. I was homecoming queen. I was prom queen. I was captain of the cheerleaders. I mean, I ran that school hands down, at least so I thought I'm running this school. Um, and I always had this sick little feeling right here and it was not a good feeling because once I took off to the races after that little NyQuil episode, it was like, I really got involved in drinking. I looked forward to drinking. I looked forward to getting drunk with my friends and I was a blackout drinker. So if any of you are blackout drinkers, you know what that means. You don't remember anything. And people have to tell you what you did and how you looked and how you lived. And it's like, I didn't do that. I would never say that. And that's how I felt. Like, I, that's not me. I would never, you know me better than that. And thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God, there was no social media. <laughs> right? Because, woo, honey, honey, honey. So I'm really glad there was no Facebook, no Instagram, no Snapchat, none of that. But, you know, I then made a a geographical move and I I went to school. I went to a Catholic college in Kansas. And um, the first thing I did was get pregnant. So it was like, boom, okay, coming out of the gate. And I had a boyfriend and I thought I was in love and all the delusions and illusions that your mind can tell you I did. But there was one thing that I did that was a little unusual. 
I didn't abort my child and I didn't raise my child. I gave my child up for adoption, which there were three other freshman girls that got pregnant and they did their various things. But I gave my child up for adoption on August 13th, 1989. And I then went back to school studiously and tried to do the best I can zipping up my life and moved back to Philadelphia and woo, you know, it just went, I went to hell in a handbag and it was not a Louis Vuitton. Okay. It was like, Whoa, what's happening here? That feeling came back again. Like something is wrong with you, Missy. And at 25 years old, um, I went into rehab. My sister had gone into rehab. My brother-in-law went into rehab. I went into rehab. And uh, they told me that I was a cross-addicted alcoholic, which I did not understand. But I took what they said as Bible and went with it. And I told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I did not like saying I was an alcoholic. I did not want to be an alcoholic. I did not look like an alcoholic. I was running for Miss America. Okay? That does not fit the description. And... I would say that at meetings, like, I don't like saying I'm an alcoholic. I just don't like saying that. And so at any rate, I quickly relapsed. But the funny thing about alcoholism is it plays tricks with you, with your mind. I know that I have a mind that lies and a disease that wants to kill me and that life can fill you up with lots of really good things. Like, woohoo! I worked at the casino, and the same thing happened at the casino as it did in high school. I became the it girl. And I loved it. You know, I thrived on that ego. And uh, I was doing TV commercials, and it was it was really good. And, and then I got married, and it was a big production. And it was like, look at Missy. Her life is wow. And I still had that little funny feeling that wouldn't go away. It was like, what is wrong with me feeling? So I got married and I instantly realized that's what was wrong with me. I was married. (laughs) And it was like, whoa. And man, when I tell you, I really tried to blame that husband of mine big time for everything. It was like, it's got to be him. It's got to be him. And I was crying the blues. But that feeling would not go away with every drink, everything I tried. It would not go away. And I really felt like it was killing me. And it was. Because every night when I drank, I felt like I wanted to die. Like I knew it. And I would call, you know, the drink and dial thing. I would call my sisters and say, I think something's wrong with me. I felt so much pain. I felt like nothing was right. And finally, thank God, um, I really did try to kill myself. I got a bottle of sleeping pills. I went to the doctor. I said, I can't sleep when I'm sober. I need something. So I took an extra pill one night. And I, when I woke up, the, li- the TV had all the lines on it, like schedatic lines. The ashtray was filled with cigarettes. And it was like coming out of like big grog. And I realized I almost ended my life. Something is not right. And a lot of people do do that. And I'm sure they're just like me. They needed an answer. I didn't know what the answer was. But I told my husband, I said, I think I have a drinking problem. He's like, you don't have a drinking problem. You just drink too much when we're out. And I was like, okay. And uh, I said, I, I want to go back to AA. And I called a friend of his, Sean. I said, I need to go to AA. He had a girl come pick me up, Millie. Millie came to the house. I had only been married one year, almost to the day, one year to the day. And I really thought my problem was being married. I really thought my problem was my ex-husband. I mean, if I could have blamed him, that would have been a big win for me. But I went to Alcoholics Anonymous and... They said, you know, are you an alcoholic? I was, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. They were like, okay, say you're an alcoholic. I said, I do not like saying I'm an alcoholic. They said, can you just admit that you're an alcoholic? Well, yeah, I got a drinking problem. My husband says I got a drinking problem. All right, well, can you at least say that? Yeah, I'm an alcoholic. So I had a really hard time spitting that out. And 
they said, well, do you think your life's unmanageable? I said, no, my life is not unmanageable. They said, okay, did you try to commit suicide? Yes, I did. Is that unmanageable? Yeah, it is. So it's like, they kept asking me questions. And it was like, okay, it's a good thing. And I had a sponsor, have a sponsor. It was my sponsor from day one. She told me to go to a big book meeting and a 12, a 12 and 12 meeting, which I did. And I started to learn in those meetings just by sitting like you're listening tonight. And this is really what I learned right here in this book, Big Green, the BB, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, that when I paid attention, I could listen and I could learn that when I admit that I am powerless over alcohol, that is my first step of surrender. That is me saying, I give up. I throw in the towel. I can't take it anymore. And I couldn't take it anymore because all I wanted to do was die sober. Now I'm not drinking. I have no default. I'm sober and I still want to die. And I still think it's my husband's fault. I still wish I could blame him for everything. And it was like, ah, and they were like, you're doing good. You're doing good. I didn't feel good. I did not feel good. And they said, you got to keep praying to God. Go to God, hit your knees, and ask him to stay sober. So I started doing that. I started saying, God, you know, help me. Help me stay sober. And I started noticing I was not drinking. I was staying sober. And yet I had this big life, this big life, where I was always jet-setting, flying here, flying there. And right after I got sober, about a month or so, I went to the Bahamas, big resort, staying there. They Guy came, butler, brought a big bottle of alcohol, like one of them big magnums. I was like, oh, my God, this is for you. Whoa, I got nervous. So I had a sponsor. I called my sponsor. I said, they just delivered a big bottle. She goes, well, they're doing their job. You do your job. Call them and tell them to take it from the room. You don't drink alcohol. I said, oh, okay. So I called them up and I said, yeah, I don't drink alcohol. Can you please remove the alcohol? They said, oh, yeah, sure, Missy. I said, oh, that was easy. Boom. I went out and got one of those buttons. That was easy. I was like, yeah. So then I started catching on. The more I admitted that I don't do that anymore, people were accepting. And I realized, oh, all that's in here. In the doctor's opinion, he starts saying that we have an allergy to alcohol. And I don't want to get that phenomenon of craving going inside of me. I don't want it to touch my lips. But what happened, what happened is people started to figure out that I wasn't drinking. And my husband started to say, I'm going to sue her for misrepresentation. So it was like, hmm, I was at my neighbor's and they were like, oh, come on, Missy, have a drink, have a beer, have a this, have a that. I was like, no, 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 I don't drink anymore. So my neighbor pulled out a bottle from the freezer and said, just take a sip. And I had all these people looking at me like you're looking at me now. So I took a sip of alcohol and I ran out of there and I called my sponsor and I said, do I have to start my sobriety all, all over? And she goes, don't sip alcohol. And I was like, I already sipped it. Do I have to admit that, you know, I did that? She said, no sipping. So then my husband got a novel idea. I'm going to take you to Italy. You're going to meet the Pope. You're going to get blessed. You're going to be redeemed and you'll be good. I was like, okay, so let's go to Italy. So we went to Italy and I started to get nervous. I started to get that funny feeling in my stomach. Something's wrong. Something's not right. Uh Uh-oh, spaghetti-o. We got there. We saw the Pope. We met the Pope. I got blessed by the Pope. I got pictures of the Pope, all that. And I was drunk within an hour. Within an hour, I was drunk. And we went back to all the same things. And I just felt that debauchery inside of me. And it was a really sick feeling. Like, I cannot believe this. I had 90 days of continuous sobriety. I had chaired my first meeting at Sage Coach Rage Coach Shootout Group. I was like, ah. I come back to New Jersey. My sponsor says, how'd you do? I said, I drank. She said, do you want to stay sober? I said, yes. I said, but I'm not going back to stagecoach and telling them because they will beat the crap out of me. She said, okay. 
<laughs> go back there. You go back there, sit quiet, and when you're ready to share, you share. I said, thank God. Thank God that's what you told me to do. I went back. I never said a word. Just sat and listened. Mm-hmm. 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 And then one night, a guy named Russian John came up to me. He goes, hey, Missy, how was it, Lee? I said, it was I. He goes, well, at least you didn't drink. And I said, yeah, I did drink. And he said, well, at least you're here. And then I realized that I finally told the truth. I finally got honest, really honest. I told this guy, Russian John, I did drink. The next day, when I went back to Stagecoach Rage Coach Shootout Group, the big czar of the meeting came up to me and said, You drank alcohol? I said, Yeah, I did, I did, I did. Said, don't give me that crap. I said, Why did you do that? And I said, I don't know. He goes, We know why. And I said, You do? Why did I drink? He said, Because you listened to that husband of yours. You didn't go to God. And I was like, I thought I did. He said, No, you didn't. You went to him. You didn't go to God. That, that's where we go, to God. You went to him, not God. And he said, you forgot the golden rule. God could and would if he were sought. And I was like, oh, I think there's some truth to that. So then I started back October 19, 2000 is my sobriety date. I started to pay attention. Oh, I don't want to get any sipping in. So I know when I hear people talk about sipping, I get sipping. Sipping got me drunk. Sipping got me drunk, got me drunk, 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 and loaded. And I never want to do that again. I never want to use alcohol in any form at all because I know what it does to me. It sets off a phenomenon of craving one sip. So I'm real clear on that. So then I found out in the doctor's opinion, whoa, that this is a love letter from God to us. Written. I love that. I love that Alcoholics Anonymous, this book book is a love letter to me. I love it to all of you. I'm like, whoa, this guy's serious. Then I started to find out that I didn't really know. I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. It was like, are they implying that I'm insane? Yes, they're implying that I'm insane. I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. I think I am a little crazy. And I started to realize that with my upbringing, my old ideas, I thought I knew who God was. I thought I really understood. And then I realized, and we agnostics that, oh, that means without knowledge. That means we don't know. We think we know. Because I know a lot of novenas. A lot. I mean, a lot. When, they, when you go to Catholic school, they teach you how to write, and they teach you how to pray really good. So it's like, well, what do I know about God? How do I get to know God? So now I'm coming to open my mind a little bit about where is God in this big picture? I need God. And when I was drinking and I was a sad sack, I went into Wawa. That's where alcoholics wander around in New Jersey. And I went in for my morning coffee and my cigarettes. That was my go-to every day. And I saw a guy from AA that I knew when I was 25 and a hot little chickie. And he said, oh, he looked at me like, you're a sad sack. He said, you know what, Missy? All you have to do is say, God help me. That's all you have to do is say, God help me. And I was like, I was just so angry with him. Like, who do you think you are? And now I feel so grateful that that man said that to me, that he really wanted to help me at nine o'clock in the morning, just by those three words. And I realize now how important that is to me as an alcoholic woman. God help me. It's like, wow, thank you. So I started doing that and stagecoach was making sure, did you pray today? Did you beg today to stay sober? I was like, yeah, yeah, I did. I did. I did. But God could and would if he were salt, Missy. I was like, okay, all right. I got it. Not your husband. I was like, okay, all right. He's so mean. I hate him. I mean, it was like, whoa. So now here I am trying to figure out where's God in all this. And I'm starting to learn that I'm catching on a little bit. I'm getting a little bit of time. I got 15 minutes. 
you know, it's like another 20 minutes. Like, thank God, hold on, just hold on to the end of the day. Cause I felt like all I wanted to do was drink, 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 drink. Gotta drink, gotta drink, gotta drink, 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 gotta drink, gotta drink, gotta drink. It was like, when does this stop? It was insane. And yet slowly, but surely I started to not think about that as much, but I was always around alcohol, always around alcohol. My lifestyle was all alcohol. So it was really, really, I was really, really challenged. And people knew me as, you know, this woman. And it was like, they expected me to be that way. I was like, I'm not that way anymore. And they were like, whoa, she's serious. I was like, yeah, I'm serious. And then I started to realize that I had to go to AA every day. I had to wake up and go to AA. So I found a little group in Ocean City, New Jersey, and I started going every day. And I started hearing things. I started paying attention. And there was a guy, um, Johnny Rocket, and uh, he came to the group one day and he said, I was new, brand, brand, brand new. And uh, he's he had long time sobriety, and I really admired him. And he said he was at a meeting in Philly, and he was working with a newcomer. And he said, the guy looked at me, and he goes, yo, Johnny, what am I going to do when my daughter graduates? I said, don't worry about it. She's only three years old. And I was like, oh, my God, that sounds like me. Because I kept wondering what what's going to happen when I did this or did that. And he was like, don't worry about it. And I was like, oh, okay. So they're just easy breezy, one day at a time, 24 hours, 20 minutes. And then I realized that people were doing steps. They were making a decision. They were definitely making decisions to turn their will and their life over to the care of God as they understood. But I still didn't understand what God's will was. And I kept asking, what's God's will? Who, what is it? I don't know what God's will is. What's God's will? And they would say, God's will for you, Missy, is to stay sober. And I was like, okay, all right. Okay, I can stay sober today. And then I started to realize that my will was what I was thinking up here. And all I was thinking was, I want to stay sober. I need to stay sober. I need God's help. God, help me. God, help me. God, help me. I was like, I'm asking God to help me. And then if I turn my will and my life, well, what, what did I have to show? I was a school teacher. I quit that when I got sober. And they, they told me, those kids are smarter than you. Quit that job, Missy. Come here. Come to AA. And I was like, okay, all right. And so I realized that my life was my actions, everything that I was putting into it, and that AA was giving me a purpose and a plan every day. I started realizing I got a purpose and a plan. I get up, I go to that meeting and I still wasn't well. I was still not well. I was still very depressed. I still had a really hard time getting out of bed, but man, God moved my feet. God did for me what I couldn't do for my, got me to that good morning ocean city group. And I would complain. I would curse. Oh my God. I would curse them people out. First thing in the morning. And it was like, they, they kept saying, we keep coming back, Missy. I was like, All right, I'll keep coming back. I will keep coming back. And so my sponsor told me, she recognized something. She goes, you know what you are? I was like, yeah, what am I, Pat? She goes, you're willing. You're willing. And I was like, okay. She said, you're willing to do this. She goes, I noticed that about you. You're very willing. I was like, Oh, okay. Well, now I'm finally getting somewhere. And then we get to, you know, after we do this prayer, and I love this prayer. You know, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me, to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self so that I may better do thy will. Take away all my difficulties. It's like, oh, thank God. And then the work begins. And then it's like, you know, launching. It's like, what's that mean? Rocket it. That means right now. Do it. I was like, oh, God. I, I felt like I didn't want to do anything. And I really didn't. And I waited and I hemmed and I hauled. And then I started hearing things. Stagecoach, Rage Coach, Shootout Group told me, if you don't take the fourth, you'll drink the fifth. 
I was like, what? Where do these people come up with this stuff? Where do you get it? I was like, what? And they made it real clear. You've got to do it. You've got to make these lists, these resentments, these people. I love everybody. F you. I love everybody. F you. Everybody loves me. And it was like, what a lie. What a delusional mind. And they said, just write it down. Who, what, where, when, why? And I still didn't know how to do it. But I started writing down who, what, where, when, why. Right? Who was I mad at? Why was I mad? What happened? Blah, blah, blah. What's my part in it? Nothing. Nothing. Everybody was everybody else's fault. Thank God you get to do it with a sponsor. And thank God for sponsorship so that I could sit down with my sponsor and review and go over and say, yeah, it really wasn't my fault. You understand that, right, Pat? She's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Keep talking, Missy. Well, the first thing I found out was before I did anything, I had to pray. Before I did anything, I always had to pray. That was my big thing. Pray, 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 pray. Because I, I always felt like, I don't know what I'm doing. I still feel like that. I don't know what I'm doing. How am I going to do this? Pray. Like, oh, okay. So I started getting through it. I started realizing I did have fears in 100,000 million forms. And they were showing up. And I remember talking to a woman in AA, Nancy Lee, and I would tell her, I hate walking through the door. I hate it. I feel like he's always mad at me. He's always mad. He's always yelling. He's always saying, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I always feel like I'm being blamed. I'm being shamed. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I can't stand opening the door. Something's always wrong. And I would feel like I did everything. I would vacuum. I would shine. I would make sure everything was nice, nice. And there would always be that one thing I forgot. And that's what I would get clobbered over the head for and she said you know what you should do I said what and she said before you open the door she goes why don't you ask God to go first why don't you ask God you go first God I'll follow you I was like all right so I started following what people were telling me to do so I would ask God to go in first and no matter what it seemed like I somehow was able to get through at least until I got to the next meeting And that was really big for me. That was really, really important for me to get to the next meeting. I always had to have a plan B because I was always involved with something that had to do with alcohol. We're going out. I'd pick him up from the airport. We'd go right to the bar. Thank God the bartender joined AA when I did. I was like, is that that odd or is that God? And I was like, is that odd or what? And he's still sober, Rich. I love it. So... Here I am writing everything down, doing the work, doing the work, doing the work. And now, you know, step five, you know, you got to admit this. And I didn't mind admitting anything to God. Like me and God were good, really good friends by now. And, you know, I knew what happened. But to somebody else seemed like, I can't do that. That's horrible. Why do they do that? Like, why? And I remember making the appointment, going to... Borders Bookstore. Does anybody remember Borders? It's long gone now. But I went to Borders Bookstore and I did the fifth step. I finally did the fifth step. Took out the paper, went through it. She asked me, is there anything else? Is there anything else you have to admit? No, 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 no. I'll never. Some things I just have to take to my grave. No, you have to admit them now. I was like, I don't want to do that, Pat. She goes, you know who, I know who you are, Isabel. I know all your escapades. I was like, but it seems so terrible to say, to actually verbalize the words of what I did. And yet, when we do, when we finally admit who we are, our dirty little secrets, and the person sitting in front of us looks us in the eye with pure, unconditional love. It is the best feeling in the world. Like, hallelujah. Thank you, God, for giving me this, for waking me up. Now I'm waking up. Now I'm coming to. Now my life is changing. Now it's a shift. It's like, whoa, things are starting to happen. It's like, it's a break mother loving through. And I can feel it. It's like, whew, thank God. That's how you feel. And that's how I felt when I left Borders Bookstore. Now it's like, whoa, now I can see. Now I can truly feel. I start to feel the physical effect of sobriety. 
I start to want to wake up in the morning. I start to want to go. I start to want to be free, really, really free. And now we get to this, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects. Sure, God, take them, take them, take them, take them, take them all. Take them all. And I realized, hmm, okay, I got to accept a lot about who I am. And then humbly asking him. And I love, I love that AA, this book is so clear because it's like, it almost gives us, I feel like it gives me the answer to everything that I needed to know to do. So it's like, it tells me real clear. And I love that Bill Wilson, whoever wrote this, all the people, however many, it doesn't matter. Crystal clear, my creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me the good and the bad so that I can humbly be with you. It's like, wow, thank God that that's easy. That's easy. Get rid of it. And now here I am. I'm moving along. I'm trudging. I'm finally getting somewhere. It's like, whoa, you know, hop to hop to hop to. I'm like, okay, God. And now I have to make a list. Well, I already had a list because I did a step. I did that step four. I had a list. I got a list. Now, I got to be willing, and I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. What? Yeah, there's some people I am not making an amends to. In fact, they owe me an amends, and that's just the way I saw it. And I was really high and mighty about that one. Like, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. Nope. They owe me an apology. And I remember... Seeing this one person in particular, and hey, well, now we're sober. I'm sober. I'm having fights with people in AA. I got a problem, right? I didn't know that because I got a mind that lies in a disease that wants to kill me. But there was a girl in AA, and man, oh man, oh man, she loved, 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 loved putting my nose in dirt. And I was like, mm mm, not happening. And so I saw her at an AA meeting. And I was told, just pray for the willingness. Again, back to the prayer. Pray for the willingness. God, help me. God, help me. God, help me. Help me be willing. Help me be willing. And I saw her at an AA meeting, and I didn't recognize her. I thought, is that her? And she's looking at me the same way. She's looking like, is that her? And so I said, hey, 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 how are you? She goes, good. How are you? I said, good. She's friendly. I was like, oh, all right. She goes, you want to get together? I was like, oh, okay. So now I know it's time for us to to come together and have an apology. And I don't feel like she needs to apologize to me first. Now I know what I have to do. Because God starts doing for us, starts softening our hearts, starts moving our feet. So I went to Atlantic City. I met with her. We talked. We had a really nice time. Now, I'm never going to be best friends again with her. But the forgiveness is the most important thing. Like now I feel like, wow, thank God. I was able to forgive. She was able to forgive. And we were able to meet in the middle. And it was just a a real gift from God. Like I really felt God's gift. I was like, huh, I cannot believe that happened. And I was really, really grateful. And I started noticing that that I started to feel really grateful about how my life was going, even though the marriage was still bad. I still felt like I got a purpose and I got a plan. And it is to stay sober and to help somebody else. And it was like, whoa, things were shifting. And then when I got to that, continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. I did not like to admit I'm wrong. I'm like most of all of you, Right. Who wants to do that? I don't want to do that. So I try not to piss people off, but I still do. And I still run my mouth and shoot my mouth off. And I got a problem with that. It's like, whoa. And I remember calling this guy Roy. Woo! Roy from Sandra and Roy's. And he picked up the phone and he said, it's a happy day at Sandra and Roy's. And I said, shut the up. He was like, Missy? I said, yeah, it's Missy, Roy. And he was like, what's your problem? I said, you're my problem. And I got into it with Roy and I'm an AA. And now I realize I have to apologize to this guy. It's like, why would I do that? Because I let my mouth run. I didn't go to God first. I didn't even think about God. So I was separated from God. I had a problem with Roy. It was like, why would I do that? But 
I started to learn from my mistakes. Shut up. Don't run your mouth. If you can, shut up. Two words. Learn that. And it was like, oh, okay. And sometimes I can do it. I still have problems every now and again. I am from New Jersey, Philadelphia. Okay. I have to preface with that. It's like, eh. So, but continuing. And how do I do that? You know, every night I read about it when I retire at night and I just look at it and I say, how was my day? Was I selfish? Was I annoying to other people? What was I doing for my day? And, you know, I was talking to Claude about it earlier when I do that, because I have upon awakening and then I flip it at night and I realize that when I go to bed at night, it's like such a good feeling of like being tucked in and like, ah, God's grace. It's that moment of like, thank you, God. You know, like, I really feel like I've lived a good day. Like, does it get any better than this? This is my life. This is what's happened. This is like beautiful. I'm like, I can't believe pinch, pinch. So I'm continuing on. And, and then, you know, it's funny, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. Now, the prayer thing, you know, I got, right? I was Catholic. I was brought up saying prayers, prayers, prayers. So now I'm praying, God help me, God help me, God help me. I got that. I don't have a problem with that. Meditation's another little thing. It's like, meditation? Who's doing that? Like, I remember when I first came to AA, yeah, I'm not doing that meditation. I was one of those people. I'm not doing that. And now it's so funny because I love to meditate. But how I learned to meditate was a newcomer. Came to Good Morning Ocean City. And I couldn't stand this girl. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. I'm still not sure. (laughs) So she comes to my morning meeting and she says, I'm meditating. I'm thinking, oh, you? Right. She says, yeah, I'm meditating. She says, I'm, (laughs) this is the funniest thing. She goes, "I, I meditate for one minute. I was like, well, who can't do that? one minute, right? Like, I'm like, oh yeah, right. You're meditating. But you know, I started doing that. So well, she could do it. I get one minute. I can do one minute meditation. So I started doing the one minute meditation and then I started upping it three minutes. I was like, I'll set that timer three minutes. I could do three minutes. Yeah. I'm getting good at it. Three minutes. Yeah. I could do five minutes. And then I started to realize that I enjoyed that quiet. I was so afraid to be quiet. I was so afraid to be quiet in my own life that God only knows what would happen if I finally just shut up. And it was like, ah, the peace is such a gift from God. It's like finally peace because the mind is constantly going. The mind is very fluid. The mind is not just lying to me, but it is truly like a drunk monkey bouncing from wall to wall, even when I'm trying to quiet it. And then what do I do? And I learned that there were things that I could do, that I could use affirmations. God is love. God is love. More of you, God, less of me. More of you, God, less of me. So let's quiet. Let's just do a one-minute meditation. Breathe in. Take Close your eyes. Take a nice, big, deep breath. Breathe in. Exhale. So that was easy. And that's where that button comes in. That was easy. More of you, God. And that brings us to working with others. Carrying this message. It's like, hmm, how do we do that? And I have found that it happens in a variety of ways and one of them, and I, ta- I was taught this in the very beginning, I was taught a lot of things, and one of them was never say no to Alcoholics Anonymous. If somebody asks you to do something, step up to the plate. So when James asked me, I did not want to step up to the plate because I'd like to go to bed early. 
Okay. I'm all sucked in, remember? I'm all, I've had a good day, God. I'm retiring. I'm looking at my day. So I like to get all tucked in and say, oh, thank you, God. And yet I knew that I had to be here tonight because this is my life. This is what I call my dharma, my calling, my passion is Alcoholics Anonymous. I love the life that God has gifted me just by staying sober, just by learning how to read, knowing where it is, what happened, why it happened. I told you what happened. I had a blackout at 12 years old from NyQuil. And now here I stand before you with 21 years of continuous sobriety. I've never had to take one more drop of NyQuil for any reason. I live a life that is beyond my comprehension. I change things a lot. I finally, thank God, had the strength to get divorced and say, I need a divorce. I need to get out of that way of life. I don't want to live like that anymore. And God has just blessed me so richly. And you know what I found out? When you have been given a lot, a lot is expected of you. And that you do, we do, need to step up to the plate. So when we are asked, we need to say yes. And I have learned a long, long time ago, ask and you shall receive. That has been a big mantra of mine for as long as I know. Ask and you shall receive. And I ask God every day to please keep me sober. Thank you, Alcoholics and God. I love you. Amen. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.